Y'all get ready. Yes, you get ready. Latest news in the streets. Join us, sentiment for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So, sir, your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Let's go ahead and start with the Stephen A. Smith and Jason Whitlock situation. And I've kind of compiled their back and forth, the, this whole thing for people who don't know. I know a lot of people are like, oh, Jason Whitlock is a coon and he's this and that. I don't agree with everything Jason Whitlock says. Y'all know that I'm the one who called his ass out. I called him out. Ben Shapiro, Officer Tatum and Candace Owens, when they sat there and tried to make excuses for the Alabama broke brawl. Because again, like I said, if the roles were reversed and these were, you know, um, black folks who were in the wrong, oh, they would have so much to say. But because the white folks were in the wrong, you know, nobody really had any commentary. You know, Stephen, not Stephen A. Smith, excuse me, Jason Whitlock was reaching, trying to blame the black people and everything else. So I've held him accountable on different occasions. But I was watching him. Um, this Cat Williams interview has literally, it's the, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I keep telling y'all that. It really is. And the only reason why it's the gift that keeps on giving, not because Shannon Sharp is some, you know, extraordinary interviewer. Um, it's because Cat Williams is a truth teller. But a lot of people are acting like Cat Williams is like the second coming of Christ. Cat Williams is not saying anything that a lot of regular people on social media have not been saying for years, okay? Not just myself, but many people have been saying a lot of things that Cat Williams has said, you know, have been calling out the industry and the things that go on behind the scenes. But when you have a celebrity actually putting it out there and calling out names, it has people shook. And so Cat Williams was basically saying that Kevin Hart is an industry plant. And so he was talking about this on Club Shay Shay, and that's what kind of led um, Jason Whitlock to talk about industry plants in the sports world. You know, like, where did these people come from? And all of a sudden, they're like, you know, these huge sports journalists. They're very opinionated. They have an opinion about everything under the sun. But if people have an opinion about them, they're upset. So this was, you know, so that's kind of the backstory. So let me go ahead and um, pull this up. We're going to go ahead and watch this here together. Oh, I don't want to watch this on Apple TV. Y'all forgive me. I'm still learning this. Uh, oh, okay. Here we go. Quick time player. Okay, there we go. I was about to say, don't do me, new Mac. All right. So this is kind of long, but I want you guys to watch this. It's going to kind of break down everything. And then I'm going to come on and, you know, speak my mind on what I, you know, my takeaway from all of this. Because um, Jason Whitlock had me doing, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was very shocked at the information that he presented. Um, pleasantly surprised, because I didn't know all of that. Which is why the studio stopped fucking with you. Why was he a risk? He chose drugs. Oh, okay. So I go to the comedy show, and I see Kevin Hart there. I'm like, what's up, Kevin? And he's like, yo, man, Cat's here. Like I was in trouble or something like that. That's what these comics understand, is that I'm not doing nothing for clout. I don't even recognize clout. But eventually, the Lord is going to let me and you be in one hallway. Kevin Hart done went 25 years without ever being in the same building with me at the same time. What, so what, if what? I go in the building, he walk out. You've never seen us in the same building ever in 25 years. Like, it's like that. <laughs> Why? Why? Yes, because yes. I'm really the product. It's not what you think. I am never under the influence of anything. I'm always in my right mind. I'm always a physical specimen. And when you see me, I'm much, much bigger than you had thought. You're going to have to look me in the eye and tell me this actually happened. Your, your tryout for the basketball team. Mm -hmm. You hit 17 threes 17, in a row? 17 straight threes. Never, 17 ne threes in a row in your tryout? Be, never before since. <laughs> never this before was a since. scrimmage? No. Oh, what, okay. What this is just shooting. No, no. Yeah. What happened was is that a guy by the name of Harold Funny Kit used to go to Winston-Salem State, Winston State University in the 70s after Earl, Mo Earl of Pearl Monroe left. And he was still tightly associated with the school. 
and tightly associated with Clarence Big House Gaines, who was the legendary coach down there, helped with John McClendon to integrate the sport of basketball. You know, the Duke players that played against the black players at, you know, at, at, on, on campus in the middle of the night when no one knew about it, they were played a role in being responsible for that game being organized and played. And so what happened is, is that um, he told Coach Gaines he had a player for him to see. And Coach Gaines had him bring me down there on a weekend. And I went out on the court. And before I stepped out on the court, rather, Coach Gaines looked at me. And then he looked at him. He said, is this the little motherfucker you've been bragging about? You know? And he said, that's him. And, and funny kid looked at me afterwards. And he said, I got you here. You're on your own now. And I hit 17 straight. 17, 17 straight three-pointers. I couldn't miss. That's I couldn't incredible. miss. And when I did that, he signed me to a scholarship on the spot. That's incredible. And, that's what and do, you, do you ever, like, think back, like, you know, maybe daydreaming, like, man, remember when I hit 17 straight Oh, times? hell yes. <laughs> I never did it since. Of course. Of course I dreamed about it. You know, no question about it. I was healthy that day. My knees weren't hurt. I hadn't cracked my kneecap in half and halted any kind of, of unforeseen dreams that I may have had or whatever the case may be. But that was my shining moment because it was immense pressure. I went down there to get a basketball scholarship. Yeah. And the pressure was on, and I showed up, and I handled my business. So I go check Winston-Salem State's basketball schedule for the 87-88 season. When, you know, this is happening in February of 1988. This covers the 87-88 season. Winston-Salem State, like... Virtually every other college basketball team during that era played a basketball game on every Saturday of February. So Stephen A. is saying that Winston-Salem State, at the end of their basketball season, when they're preparing for their conference tournament, and what, and maybe trying to qualify for the Division II postseason tournament, that they play a game on Saturday... He wakes up the next morning, they're having a scrimmage that he arrives to late in the middle of, and Big House Gaines checks this six foot one, 150 pound guard from New York City who played a couple of months of high school basketball without acquiring any stats or anything, played a month or two of junior college basketball without acquiring any stats or anything, he shuts down a practice, checks Stephen A. Smith into the scrimmage, and then, according to Smith's account, he knocked down 17 straight shots in the scrimmage, and Big House Gaines offered him a full scholarship immediately after the practice. I, I, I'm reading this, and when I read it, I was like, you got to be kidding me. This is a comic book, and this man's calling this his memoir. He got a full ride scholarship after checking into a Sunday scrimmage after a team played a basketball game on Saturday, knocks down 17 straight shots, and the coach of this team, which if you go read Big House Gaines' memoir, his book, his biography, all Big House Gaines did was complain about how limited his budget was at Winston-Salem State, how the school wasn't flush with cash and a bunch of scholarships for his players. He was always trying to make ends meet. But this frail, frail kid from New York City, he gave a full scholarship to next year's team after watching him play for an hour in a scrimmage because he allegedly knocked down 17 straight shots. Who writes this? Who believes this? I cannot appropriately do justice to the far spread story Stephen A. Smith paints in Straight Shooter. Smith has struggled to explain it himself on TV. In November of 2022, not that long ago, November of 2022, what is that, 14 months ago, 15 months ago, on the set of NBA Countdown with Malika Andrews, Jalen Rhodes, and J.J. Reddick, ESPN ran a graphic of Smith, Rhodes, and Reddick's uh, senior year stats. Let's play this clip. I want to. I don't know what 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 is it. Yeah, slot number four. I, or no, yeah, slot number three. Number three. I want to play the clip of Stephen A. Smith, of Malika Andrews, and J.J. Reddick and Jalen Wills. Here's Stephen A. Smith talking about his senior year. 
we're covering off college hoops, guys. Yeah. So I do want to show you all a little something. I got a little something to show you here. Before we dig into the NBA, take a look at this blind resume here. It's three players, their scoring average in each person's final college season. Do we, do we have any guesses who this might be? Jalen, who do you think? What, what, what is this? Nah, this is hilarious. JJ's on the right. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it's our starting lineup for tonight. Well, they're not telling us. But, they, but they're not telling us I only played one game because I cracked my kneecap in half. But that's neither here. That is neither here. Did, did y'all just look and hear what Stephen A. Smith just said on national TV? They put his senior year stats up. Everybody's giggling. And you can tell Stephen A. is pretty uncomfortable early on. He ain't in on the joke or maybe no one warned him. I don't know. He tried to loosen up at the end. But then at the end, he says, what they're not telling y'all is I only played one game because I cracked my knee. And then, so, look, look. I'm not good at math. That math is not my strength. I was a writer, and, and, you know, I struggle. I use both my hands and toes to count. But walk me through this and walk yourself through it. One and a half points per game. How do you average that in one game? Is there a one and a half pointer in Division II basketball? How, how do you do it? It can't be done. See, see, it can't be done. It's comical. This is Stephen A, baby. I'm not running from anybody. And if somebody is going to misquote me, usually I'm going to make an, an effort to set the record straight. Now, there are people in the media, fat bastards to be specific, who are completely <laughs> irrelevant and, and are starving for attention because all they have left is clicks because their credibility has been shredded everywhere else. Let me take a deeper dive. Let me take a look at who Stephen A. Smith is. Why does this dude think he can call me out of my name and run around like Mr. Tough Guy and, and he, he wants to smoke? Let me see what he's standing on. So I read his memoir. And when I read his memoir, it was laughable. Just as a journalist, don't pass the smell test, were enormous and plastered all throughout the book. And that's why I call him Stephen A. Myth. All he does is make noise by coming after the very people who did and still does what he aspires to do, but no longer has the outlet to do because he is considered a vile, despicable human being that no one wants anything to deal with. Nothing. That's who he is. I will not be speaking on him anymore. Stephen A. Smith has vowed to never say my name again. He doesn't have to say my name again. That's not the point. I want him to explain his book. That, that's, you don't have to mention my name. Just address the questions about your book and this farcical narrative that you've been promoting. <laughs> All right, y'all. That is a hot damn mess, okay? So, yeah, I had, the, I had my tiny violin ready. <laughs> okay, so... My thing is, like I said, I never looked into like Stephen A's background. I didn't read the book. But at the end of the day, Jason did make some good points. So I had assumed, okay, let's be fair. Let's, you know, give Stephen A a chance to respond back to Jason Whitlock. Because we all know, you know, Jason Whitlock can be messy and, you know, all that stuff. And I literally watched the entire hour of Stephen A Smith's response. All he did was curse rant, rave, talk about everything but this one and a half points that he made um, during the one game that he played in college. He didn't address anything concerning the points that Jason Whitlock, you know, came up with. And usually when people deflect like that, I feel like they do that because they they know they're lying. So let me try and be the loudest in the room. Like, like I always say, the, the loudest bitches in the room usually won't bust a grape, right? 
So he's yelling and ranting and calling this man a fat bastard and everything but a child of God and talking about how, you know, he helped him out and how Jamel Hill didn't like him. He was talking about everything but the points that Jason Whitlock was addressing. The whole story sounds like nonsense. It, it just does, you know, and honestly, it makes you really question some of these people who are in these positions, like what authority do they really have? Because Stephen A is very critical. That's why, you know, I and a lot of people watch him. He's very critical, very opinionated when it comes to sports. He's quick to say who's whack, who needs to retire, you know, who's going to be the first round draft pick. Um, you know, he, he, he brings that smoke. And then to find out that he really didn't play a lick of basketball. Like, to me, that's kind of insane. Like, you weren't there. You, you don't have bad knees. You don't have a bad back. You know, you know, a lot of basketball players, they get older. They suffer from a lot of, you know, injuries, and they go through stuff in their old age. And he keeps saying that he had some type of knee injury. Um, okay. And another thing that I think nobody else is pointing out that's strange to me is that when he was talking to that white man, and I forgive me, I just can't think of his name, he said that he made 17 three-pointers in a row. 17 three-pointers. Think about this. Picture it, okay? Like the Golden Girls. Picture it. The year is 1980-something. Like, three-pointers weren't even that popular back in the day. Like, back in the day, you really played hardcore basketball. Your main thing was to drive all the way to the hoop. It was mainly about two-pointers and dunking. Y'all remember one of my favorite games growing up was NBA Jams. And remember that was the whole thing. You'd be like, you, you go to the rim and you try and jump and, and get the ball in there. And it'd be like, you're on fire. Like nobody was even shooting three-pointers like that in NBA Jams. Like you wanted that. You're on fire. You wanted to do a dunk. So I, I'm just saying like three-pointers are more popular now, right? Especially because of Steph Curry. So I said, well, maybe I'm tripping, but I just don't remember three-pointers being a big thing in the 90s and the, you know, especially, I guess, in the 80s. Like, that just wasn't, like, a big thing. So that kind of was, like, I, I had to side-eye that. So I found this post on Reddit because I'm like, okay, maybe I'm tripping. And so even, like, this is an old post from, like, I think two years ago, right? talking about three-pointers and they were saying, you know, like why weren't three-pointers popular back in the day? And they were saying, um, one, it was cons it was considered gimmicky amongst, um, upon initial introduction. Um, most coaches prior to the 2000s grew up mastering a game that had no three-point line. Many players of the 90s didn't grow up with a three-point shot. <laughs> uh, tradition, it's very difficult to buck the establishment. Uh, general play style evolution, the growth of three ball aligns somewhat closely with the modern evolution of Showtime Dunk in both cases. First and second generation three point shooting, obtaining positions of power. Seven long standing and widespread belief that the closer shot is the better shot. Remember, like I told you guys on NBA Jams. You know, they be things like, you know, just encouraging you to drive to the basket, you know what I'm saying, and be on fire and dunk. So I'm just, so as I'm listening to this, I'm like, I just don't remember three-pointers being a thing back then. So for him to say he had three of them, you know, no, excuse me, 17 three-pointers in a row. 17? And even when we listen to the story, right, most ball players are very egotistical, you know, low-key narcissist. Um, we've all heard the term ball hog, right? Where, you know, there's always a kid on the team that doesn't really want to pass to the other players because they want to be the star. So you mean to tell me, um, shout out to T. Rich. He liked NBA jams. He said that was his game, mine too. So you mean to tell me there's a team of guys. They just played the game on Saturday. They're a team. So meaning that they practice together, they know each other. You know, when you're a team, you're like brothers for the most part. So you mean to tell me that this team of guys who played the game before on Saturday allowed this nobody, quote unquote, right? He came there with some guys, um, with a guy that he had dated the guy's sister. So he was invited to this scrimmage on that Sunday. So you mean to tell me that the other guys on the team all of a sudden trusted Stephen A? Most people, when you bring somebody onto the team to come and play, 
Um, especially if you're the new guy. The new guy is lucky if he can even look at the ball, let alone get the ball to make 17 three-point shots. This story is cap. Okay, the cap on this app, like I said in the chat, it doesn't make sense. Most basketball players are not on a team are not going to be passing the ball to the newbie. And then it's not like he's coming on as some huge specimen, like he's seven foot one. Average height, scrawny. He said those were his own words. And so y'all yeah, want me to believe that these guys just kept, here you go, random guy that we've never played with before. Here you go. Keep on hitting those three pointers, 17 in a row. Really? I, I don't, I'm just, I'm not buying this. I don't know if people have looked at it from that angle, but honestly, Jason Whitlock made some good points. I have to be fair. Y'all know I'm unbiased. You know, I'm not a big Jason Whitlock fan, but he made some very, very decent points when he did this analysis. And then when he, <laughs> then there was a part where, um, he ended up bringing like Stephen A. Smith, his old teammates <laughs> on ESPN with some type of, I don't know, ceremony. When I tell you, his old teammates are literally my height in heels. Like all of these guys are like 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, I'm like, this was the starting lineup on your college sports team? Are you serious? Stephen A. Smith was the tallest one out of all these guys. And the one guy that he had pretending to be, you know, the guy that, that uh, Jason Whitlock found an article on, in the article it said that that guy was six foot three. But when you see the guy standing next to Stephen A. Smith, he can't be any taller than five eight. <laughs> So it just makes me think, like, who is Stephen A. Smith? Like, who is he? It was it was just, yeah, there's like a whole little ceremony. Y'all got to go see it's on ESPN unless they private it the video or something, child. And it's supposed to be his old college teammates. But he's literally the tallest one, and he's only six foot one. Everybody else is like five six, five seven, five eight at the most. I'm like, this was the starting lineup? I know taller 16 year olds than that. Like, it's just weird. The whole thing was just weird. So, like I said, I think um, Jason made some really good points. Stephen A. Smith is just out here capping and, you know, telling these, you know, fan fantastic tall tales. And it's not a good look. And a lot of people are saying, oh, um, you know, oh, this is, you know, it's black on black, this is wrong, you know, people trying to bring down the black man. Why is it that anytime somebody brings up factual stuff, when somebody says, hey, this doesn't make sense, people always want to pull the reverse race card. No, I don't think this is anything to do with bringing down the black man. And especially, let's stop acting like Stephen A. Smith is like some sensitive, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, Lily. Like Stephen A. Smith be going off, he be cussing folks out, he be dragging folks. So why when he gets a little bit of smoke from Jason Whitlock, all of a sudden, oh, y'all need to leave him alone. Y'all are trying to take down that good black man. I don't think anybody's trying to take him down, but let's also not forget that Stephen A. Smith many times has called for other people's jobs. Look how much he, you know, shitted on Kyrie Irving simply for posting, you know, that stupid ass movie I even forgot what it was called, that the Jewish people, was they was all riled up about. And he went in on Kyrie Irving. And Kyrie Irving really don't bother nobody. You know, so I don't feel bad for him. I just think his story's bullshit. Um, am I going to still watch the show? I mean, possibly, if I have nothing else to do in the mornings. You know, I'll, I'll catch him like I've been doing. But now I just had the side eye. Like his, his whole backstory is bullshit. And now to me, his credibility is somewhat shot because he spent an hour ranting and raving and cursing and, you know, calling this man fat and a piece of shit, you know, saying all this derogatory stuff. But did Jason lie? You didn't address any of the lies. The, the story just does not make any sense. And again, he, he didn't make this up. This is all in Stephen A. Smith's biography. This is all in his book. This is stuff that he said in interviews. And again, I never put two and two together just because I never cared that much. But since Jason Whitlock is putting two and two together, I'm going to do my own little investigation. And the more I dug into it, I'm like, this story is bullshit. It doesn't make any sense. That's not how it works. That's not how you get a scholarship. And three-pointers weren't even that popular back in the day. 
And I just remember that from playing NBA jams. Because <laughs> I remember like that was what everybody used to try and do was try to drive to the hoop, you know what I'm saying? And dunk and all that stuff. Like three pointers, you know, they were there, but they weren't really popular, you know? So the fact that he just sat here and just made up this whole lie, just is just it's very interesting. And again, it just goes to show you that a lot of these people, they get into positions not really because they earned them and not really because, you know, they worked hard. You know, sometimes they're just placed there. That's why I feel like sometimes like this world is just so full of crap. It's like we tell kids, you know, and we tell people, you know, be a good person, do the right thing, you know, go to school, get your degree, and then you'll be promised a good job and a house and all this stuff. And then we find out later on in life, it's like everything we've known has just been a fucking lie. I don't know. Like even the people who are in certain positions, it's like they're not even who they say they are. So... I'm sorry, but I'm with Jason Whitlock on this one. I don't think he said anything wrong. And like I said, I gave Stephen A. Smith a fair shake. I wanted him to respond to this. He never responded. I'm still trying to figure out how you only get half a point, a point and a half or whatever he got, you know, playing the one game in college. It's just like, none of it makes sense. But yet he's on a platform. He has millions of watchers and listeners and he's given critique and He's never even done half of what he's critiquing. You know, that's why even for me, when people like leave comments and say, oh, you're such a good journalist, or I look at you as a journalist, and I always tell people, don't call me a journalist because I'm not. Like, I might have integrity, I have journalistic integrity, but a journalist is a title for somebody who actually went to college and they have a journalism degree. I don't have a journalism degree. I'm just self-taught. I'm just a good researcher. You know, like I never want to take credit for people who actually went to school for that. So somebody who actually went to college and they actually played college ball and they actually played, you know, professional ball, you know, everybody can have their opinion, right? Because we're all Sunday, Monday morning quarterbacks where, you know, we give our opinions on games and statistics and things like that. But for him to be so critical and you've never even played like a serious game in college, to me is just comical. So Jason Whitlock, I mean, he really put it out there. So, like I said, I had no idea it was that bad, but from what I researched, Stephen A. Smith is a lie as far as that part of his life. It was just, it was nothing but cap. And he just needs to own it. He needs to just say, yeah, I over-exaggerated. I was just trying to sell books and keep it moving. But all, you know, the tantrum and the hooping and hollering, people who yell and deflect, um, who can't just have a normal, rational conversation, they're usually known documented liars, you know, because... People who are telling the truth, there's nothing to scream and, and shout at walls about. When you're telling the truth, it just comes out naturally. When you have real receipts, when you have, you know, things to back up your facts, and when you're sure about what you're saying, it just comes out. There's no need to hoop and holler and expose and all this weird shit that bitches do on social media. So, again, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it at all. If you want the latest news in the streets, join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity, so sell your friends and your family. It's the Lovely Tea TV Show, bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the Lovely Tea TV Show, be sure to share, like, and subscribe.